Thanks. Thank you. Can you all hear me all right? All right. Thank you all for coming. I, I, um, I appreciate it. So uh, voting is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, this uh, talk is about fairness in voting systems. Uh, by the way, there's a, little, uh, there's a little counter down here, so you can, if you're worried about when it's going to be over, that'll, <laughs> that'll tell you. We're already at number two. Um, fairness in voting systems is what, uh, what I want to talk about. Um, specifically, the um, unfairness in voting systems, I guess, is more interesting than fairness, and uh, in our system of voting in particular. Um, first of all, what I don't mean, I'm not going to talk about actual cheating on elections. That's not the kind of fairness that I'm talking about. Um, there is such a thing as actual cheating, uh, but that's not what I want to talk about. I want to just talk about the basics uh, counting system which is used in uh, voting. Um, assuming, we're just going to assume that everybody is following the rules, so I'm not talking about that kind of fairness, all right? Uh, also, I'm not going to talk about the Electoral College. The Electoral College is, is sort of a, an insane overlay onto our system, which is basically just about counting up people's votes. And then we do this Electoral College thing, which is very um, weird, and it makes everything just a little bit weirder. I, that, you could, you could make a case that that's unfair for various reasons, but that also is not what I'm going to talk about. I want to talk about the very basic sort of fundamental uh, concept of everybody votes and you count them all up and you decide the winner. That's what I want to talk about. Um, it turns out to be much more complicated than you might expect. This is one of those things that uh, turns out to be more complicated than you expect. Um, voting, uh, if you think about it, and I'm going to encourage you to think about it in a certain way, is kind of an insane idea. Here's, so you imagine a bunch of people disagree about something. And how are we going to decide? Well, you ask everybody what their opinion is, and then you combine all of their answers, and then you have a single decision, right? Uh, the, and that, that represents the will of the people. If you think about that, that actually, um, on the surface of things, that doesn't really sound like a great idea to me. If a bunch of people disagree, and you say, oh, well, let's just combine all of our preferences into a decision, that, uh, that should seem like, a, on, on some level, kind of a silly idea. It sounds a little sketchy, right? Um, it certainly should not be obvious that anyone is going to um, be satisfied with the outcome if you try to do this among a group of people who disagree. Yeah, there's plenty of seats down here for you, or on this side. Come on, walk in front of everybody. It's all right. They're all looking at you now. Okay. Here's what really complicates everything about, um, about this. Just over there. Preferences of groups of people do not behave like preferences of individual people, all right? You can talk about an individual person's preference, but when you start talking about a preferences of a group of people, that is really a fundamentally different thing, and it does not behave nicely in the way that individual preferences behave. This actually has a name. This is called the Condorcet Paradox. It's named after a Condorcet, which is a, who's a French sort of mathematician and political scientist who... Um, was sort of a victim of the French Revolution. He was an aristocrat and um, was sentenced to be executed and died in mysterious circumstances the night before he was to be executed. Uh, nobody's really sure if he was, it, he was poisoned in his cell and it's not clear if he poisoned himself because he was gonna be executed or if something else happened. Anyway, um, this is the Condorcet paradox. Preferences of groups of people do not behave like preferences of individual people. Here's an example. Let's imagine an election with three candidates. I'm going to call them A, B, and C. I'm usually going to call candidates A, B, and C. I hope you agree. Nobody would ever say, I like A more than B, and I like B more than C, and I like C more than A. That doesn't really make any sense for an individual person to say that. Because, um, well, because, if you'll allow a fancy word here, individual preferences are transitive. If you remember the, the, this word from uh, math, you probably had in high school. Transitive means like if A is bigger than B and B is bigger than C, then A is bigger than C, right? It doesn't make any sense for A to be better than B and B to be better than C and also C to be better than A, right? That uh, doesn't make sense. But if we ask a group of people, say, to rank their choices between A, B, and C, and let's say that they come up with these rankings. So what I mean by this, you're going to see a lot of things that look like this. Can you see mine? Yeah. Uh, 15 people say I like A the best and then B and then C. 11 people say I like B the best and then C then A. And 13 people say I like C the best and then A and then B, right? Um, here, you can, you know, do the math on this one. 
72% of the people prefer A over B. That would be all 15 of these people and all 13 of these people. And if you sort of add up, you know, how many total people there are, that's 72% of the people. They like A better than B. 67% like B better than C. And you know what I'm going to say here? 62% like C better than A. Think about that. So a majority of people prefer A over B, a majority of people prefer B over C, and a majority of people prefer C over A. So what is the will of the people? Well, I guess they're, they're confused or something. I mean, as a group, there is no coherent will that they're all expressing about these, uh, these candidates, right? So uh, I hope you agree this is to demonstrate the Condorcet paradox, right? Individual preferences do not behave like collective preferences, all right? Because individuals' preferences are always transitive, but the preferences of a group of people don't uh, necessarily have to be, all right? So here's a major goal. We're going to talk about various different ways to look at a bunch of preferences and decide the winner, all right? This sounds like, a, like an impossible task, you know, in a situation like this. How are you going to decide who should be the winner in this case? Um, I don't know. Anyway, there are various ways, right? Uh, and we're going to talk about, you know, which is the best of these ways. And towards that end, let's, let's, let's agree on some sort of basic principles, right? A, a method for selecting the winner, which I'll sometimes call a winner selective me selection method, should analyze the preferences and choose a winner based on some relevant details of those preferences, right? Uh, in particular, for a reasonably fair system, if there actually is some sort of uniform preference among the people, then that should be reflected in the decision of the election, right? And the decision should not depend on irrelevant details that are present in the preferences of the group of people, all right? So th this is sort of what we're leading towards, all right? So, ah, let's vote. Um, this is sort of my, my little multimedia extravaganza. I hope this works. Uh, I want us all to vote uh, in this uh, little election that we're about to have. Um, what you can do is, okay, so I don't want to vote for the US president. I, I did that this morning. Um, it was a good, it's a good thing to do, but uh, let's make it a little more interesting. I want to vote for these guys. Remember these guys? I want to vote for the second best bounty hunter from The Empire Strikes Back. Okay, obviously Boba Fett is the best. All right? I want to vote for the second best. I hope you can see these guys. Now, I have right here a big old chocolate bar, and this is going to go to whoever can name for me the most of these guys. Um, is there anybody willing? Now, I talked with Sean... Um, uh, a couple weeks ago about this, so he, he's disqualified because we just talked about. Now, when I, when I had this idea, I'm going to confess, uh, other than Boba Fett, I could name four out of five of these guys. Is there anybody who can name uh, any of them? Anybody know? You have to, you have to judge the trade-off between the, um, the enjoyment of getting the reward and the embarrassment of uh, admitting to everyone else that you know the names of these guys. Anybody want to try for it? Whoever knows the most, of, does anyone even know one of their names? Darth, no, he's not one of them. <laughs> and what about this guy back here, right? Yeah. That helmet guy, he probably has a name. But Nobody wants to go for it? Wait, wait, wait. It's one of the Nuke Gunray. No. no. Nuke Gunray is one of the... Uh, one of the, the guys from that, that other trilogy of Star Wars movies. But he totally gets me anyway. You should get, yeah, you should. Can anyone better that? <laughs> All right, I don't want the candy, so you deserve it for that. Thank you. Pass it back. Yes, thank you. All right. I'm going to tell you all. Okay. Uh, so, Boba Fett is the best. We're going to vote for the second best. All right. Here are your choices. These five of them. Come on, really? Nobody knows any of these guys? All right, this one is Bosk. Zuckus, Forlom. <laughs> See, I, I told you I could name four out of five of them. My, my problem was I was confusing Zuckus and Forlom. Their heads are very similar. Um, Dengar. Dengar. Yeah, you, uh, you were almost there. Yeah. And Ig88. All right. These are your choices, okay? So you're going to vote for which of them is the best. And to make it interesting, I want everyone to rank your choices in the style of that, that sort of uh, example election. So you're going to choose your number one, number two, et cetera. There are five of them, all right? And after we vote, we're going to count up all the votes and decide who's the winner. So your ballot is going to look like this, right? You choose sort of, uh, you know, your first choice in the first row and then choose your second choice, et cetera. 
hit the big button and your vote will be counted. So here's what you got to do. Oh, it's got the wrong address here. Sorry. I've got, so what you want to do is get out your uh, smartphone or whatever. I also have an iPad here that can do this. And I, my apologies, I got the address. I have to rerun my little thing here. What you're going to do is connect to, um, connect to, there's a Wi-Fi network, network in this room called Stecker. Great yeah, thanks. Connect to that. Blah, blah, blah. Almost there. Sorry about this. In a moment, it's going to happen. All right, there we go. Go back to... Okay, so connect to the Stecker Wi-Fi network and then visit this address, stecker.local slash vote. And if anybody needs a... Um, can someone confirm to me that, that they have this working? If anybody... Oh, come on. Is it not working? You're on the network? Is anybody on it? Yeah? Can you get the can you see the page? Loading. I hope that this works. Should work. I think you know, this may be what happens when you ask a room full of people to connect to this is all serving on my uh, laptop here, so sorry. We're only going to try this for a few more minutes, and then I'm going to bail on this. Does anybody see it? Maybe we should not try to all do this at the same time. That, that, uh, that maybe I can feel my computer getting hotter. So, so some people are connected to it. Yeah? Did you, did you vote? You see the page? It's still loading. Okay. That's a 2009 Yeah. Any uh, any success? Can anyone see that? Oh, this is a disaster. All right. If you if you if you're not connecting within a few minutes, then I'm just going to uh, I'm going to call it off. Did anybody vote? You did. All right. Somebody voted. Okay. Yeah. All right. So how about this? I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna continue talking about things once you once you've voted. Don't try to keep on like refreshing because you're gonna overload my computer here. But uh, uh, I'll go. I'll go for a few minutes here, and then we'll we'll uh, talk about the results. Hopefully, everyone will get on. Okay. So, um, are you are you capable of listening while you're waiting? Sorry, <laughs> sorry if that's distracting. All right. Here's what we're gonna do. Once we have all the votes, we're gonna tally them up uh, in the obvious way. All right. Anyone want to imagine how we're gonna tally up the votes? Yeah, let's just tally them up, right? I think if you think if you think about this, think this through a little bit, you will realize actually there is no obvious way to just tally them up, all right? What you have, the votes consist of a bunch of people's preferences. What are you going to do to just you just add them all up? Well, you can't really. I mean, if I like Bosk and then Dengar and then Zuckus, how do I add that to someone else who likes? Forlom and then Zuckus and then, uh, you know, you can't just add them all up, right? So I was kind of uh, joking when I said we'll tally them in the obvious way. There isn't any obvious way to do this. I'm not saying there's no way to do it, but um, there are a lot of different ways that you could uh, tally up the results of the election, all right? Lots and lots of winner selection methods. And even um, a lot of them are reasonable, and even reasonable uh, alternative systems will produce different outcomes for the election. So you have to choose how are you going to actually add up all the votes, all right? This is a little quote from Stalin. Uh, he said, I consider it completely unimportant who in the party will vote or how, but what is extraordinarily important is this, who will count the votes and how. I don't think Stalin is really talking about the same thing that I'm talking about, but it's true that um, it's important how you count the votes, all right? It is not obvious, in this scenario at least, it's not obvious how you should even count up these votes. It is important how you count. Okay, here comes eight different ways for counting up the votes of various, they will seem, some of them will seem totally reasonable, some of them will seem ridiculous. 
Um, one is called the plurality system, and this is basically how we do it in uh, the United States. Whoever gets the most first place votes is the winner, right? On our ballots in the United States, for the most part, you're not allowed to rank your preferences. You just choose who you want to win, and then whoever the most people chose, that's the winner. That's called the plurality system, all right? In this, set, in this system, all rankings except the first place are ignored, right? In the plurality system, it doesn't do you any good to specify any rankings other than who you think should be the winner, all right? Uh, okay, here's something called the anti-plurality system. This is somewhat silly. Whoever gets the fewest last place votes is the winner, right? Instead of whoever gets the most first place votes. This uh, sort of elects the least bad candidate rather than the most good candidate. This is like if you believe that all political elections are about the lesser of two evils, then you should really use this system. This, this actually counts the lesser of the two evils, all right? The least bad candidate. That's called the anti-plurality system. Okay, here's another one called the Borda count. In this case, you add up a bunch of points. And if you have N candidates, every time you vote someone in the first place, they get N points. A second place vote gets N minus one points, etc. And a last place vote gets one point. So in our example, in our election with five candidates, whoever you ranked first would get five points. Whoever you ranked second would get four points, etc. And you add up all the points and see who has the most points, and they're the winner. All right, oh, here's a little example. If the candidates are A, B, C, and people vote like that, then what does A get? Okay, for, so one person voted A, then B, then C. So A will get three points from that one vote. That's one times three. A will get one point from each of these voters, but there were three of them, so they get three times one points from this one. A gets two points from these two voters, so that's two times two. And then A gets three points from these four voters, so that's four times three. Add them all up, you get 22 points. I told my students, uh, or whoever I advertise this to. We're not going to use any fancy math. We're just going to add numbers, and at one point, we're going to multiply. This is that point. So if you don't like multiplying, it, it's almost over. Um, <laughs> B, in the same way, gets this many points. C gets that many points. So C is the winner, according to the board account method. All right? C is the winner. Uh, by the way, who, who in this election would win using the plurality system? Yeah, A would win using the plurality system. That's the one where you just add up the number of first place votes. In that case, A would be the winner. All right. Okay, here's another one. It's called the instant runoff system. You do several rounds, and each time you eliminate the candidate with the fewest first place votes. So in this example here, in the first round, C has the fewest first place votes, and we eliminate C in the first round. What that looks like is this. You remove C entirely from everybody's ballot, and then you look at the preferences once you get rid of C, and they look like that. But this is the same. You can just combine. Like I had A, Bs here, and also A, Bs here and here. So you combine them up, you get that. And now B has, and then you keep on doing this. Eliminate people in each round until there's only one person left. So at this point, B has fewer first place votes, so they get eliminated, and then A is the winner. All right? This, this method actually used in a lot of places, um, Australia and Ireland, in their like, major political elections. This is used in some local elections in the United States, and it's becoming uh, a bit more mainstream. Downside of this is basically you have to do, use a computer to do this if you have uh, a large amount of people voting. That's not so bad. I'm using a computer right now. Some variations on instant runoff, okay? One is the Coombs method. The same, but in each step you eliminate the one with the most losing votes instead of eliminating the one with the fewest winning votes, all right? Here's another one, the Baldwin method. In each round, you eliminate the one with the lowest Borda points. All right, all of these seem like reasonable ways to do it. Uh, are they all the same? It turns out they're not. You can get different answers when you do each of these different methods. Um, even though they, they all seem reasonable, uh, they all give you different answers. Which one are you supposed to use? I don't know. Uh, pairwise comparisons, here's another one. You imagine that the candidates are facing each other in one-on-one um, one -on -one sort of face-offs. And you decide who would win if it was only between, say, A and B. And then who would win if it's only between B and C, right? Whoever wins the most of those face-offs is declared to be the winner of the election. Right? That's called the pairwise comparisons method. Uh, here's the craziest one I'm going to talk about, the random dictator method. You choose a single ballot at random, and whoever they ranked first is the winner. All right? that, that one that you chose is called the random dictator, because they're the ones who decide. Whatever they say, that's who wins. All right? This sounds like an insane method, but actually, if you think about it sort of mathematically, it doesn't sound all that bad. Um, if you have a person with, say, a certain X percentage of support in the general population, they're going to win the election with probability X percent, right? 
Like if someone is actually preferred by 50% of the people and you do the random dictator, they're going to win 50% of the time, which in a certain crazy way, that kind of makes some, some sort of sense, right? Um, nobody would do this in real life, right? But it, in a sense, it's not a bad idea. Um, ah, here's a little digression. Actually, people did uh, do something like this in real life. Votes by lottery were actually common in the ancient democracies. So a little preface, I really know uh, almost nothing about ancient democracies. But um, I read about this stuff, and I thought it was interesting. In uh, ancient Athens, almost all government offices were filled by lotteries. And in their view, election by voting would favor candidates who were rich, eloquent, and well-known. Does that sound familiar? Um, whereas election by random lotteries doesn't, uh, doesn't do that, right? Here's a quote from Aristotle. It is accepted as democratic when public offices are allocated by lot and as oligarchic, that is ruled by sort of the elite or by a small group when they're filled by election. So actually they viewed elections by voting as undemocratic. And the true democracy was by randomly choosing the leaders because that's the only way you can be sure that you're getting a real um, representative of the people as a whole, rather than just choosing your leaders from wealthy sort of uh, ruling class, political class, right? Voting was not viewed as a part of democracy. It was something else. This is what I just said. A true government of the people should be made up of ordinary people chosen at random. We have that in some aspects, like juries in the, in the United States are chosen at random. Uh, that's kind of a, a similar idea. You would probably... What? They elected the jury. They did it the exact reverse. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. That's pretty weird. <laughs> he said in Athens, they actually uh, chose the leaders at random, and they had elections for the juries. Who knew? I didn't. He did. <laughs> OK, anyway, uh, let's see the results. It looks like most of you have sort of calmed down with your phones, so um, you're finished voting. You're finished doing whatever else you're doing with your phones. Um, so I'm going to see here, I have my special results page here, I'm going to click on results. Okay, so here's the winners. <laughs> All right, I have my little vote totals here. So these are who voted for what? One, two, three, four, five, eight people voted for. All right. Um, here are all the votes, right? There's zero for most of these because among five candidates, there's actually a lot of different possibilities. Um, you, do, you do the math on that one. Five votes for five, four, three, two, one. Something tells me you weren't being entirely uh, thoughtful about those votes. Um, all right. I, I hope that uh, you have skewed the uh, outcome of the election. That would be a shame if this was not actually a representative of our preferences. Okay, the plurality winner is Bosk. You can see, all right, Dengar got 16 first place votes. Zuckus got nine. Uh, so Bosk and Dengar were pretty close, but Bosk uh, eked it out for the win. By the plurality system, that's the one where you only count the first place votes. Okay, the anti-plurality system, Zuckus was the winner. All right, this is the one where you count the last place votes, and the one with the fewest last place votes is the winner. So that would be, what? Something's wrong here. Um, something's messed up. I wrote, I, I should say, I wrote all these programs myself, so if there are bugs, that shouldn't surprise me. Uh, the board account, let's see if this one, what? yeah, that's okay, right? Boss got 201 board points, so he's the winner, all right? Um, Maybe I just shouldn't click these little things, and then there's no, uh, <laughs> no way to check if these are accurate. The instant runoff system was BOSC. Remember, this is the one where you, you throw out the, um, the person with the fewest first place votes in each round, and then until only one person is left. Coombs, this is the one where you throw out the biggest loser in each round, BOSC won. Baldwin, this is the one where you throw out the uh, lowest board of score in each round, and Bosk won. Those three ones, they are, they are really different, but uh, in most situations, they'll give you the same result. So it's not surprising. Pairwise comparisons was Bosk. Bosk, you can see Bosk got four pairwise comparison points. Um, that means actually he won every single pairwise comparison. So Bosk was actually able to defeat every other candidate in terms of a head-to-head -head matchup. Um, Buckland. This is one that I, I, didn't, I decided to cut out for time. I didn't explain what the Buckland system is, but IG-88 won under the Buckland system. And then the random dictator was 4 Lom. All right? Uh, if, if I hit this little refresh button, you should see the same. 
She goes, hey, there's a different one. That's the only one that changes every time you refresh the results. You get another <laughs> random dictator, Dengar. That's the only way Dengar is going to win, I guess, is by the random dictator. All right. So I hope you're convinced that these methods can give you different answers. Now, some of these methods are kind of ridiculous, but a lot of them seem you know, more or less uh, reasonable methods for choosing the winner. And, but we still get different answers for them, which is a little, I don't know, a little upsetting maybe. All right, uh, those are the results. So the moral of the story, I'm glad that it worked out this way. Different reasonable voting methods produce different outcomes. All right? I'm, I'm glad that that worked out. I, w I was a little unsure when I was coming to this talk if that was actually going to happen. If they were all the same. Actually, I'll show you my backup plan. I hope you don't mind. If, 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 all, the, if all the winners turned out to be the same, this is what I was going to do. I was going to say, oh, I think something's wrong. I better, I'm going to click this one. Okay, now, yeah, that looks better. All right. <laughs> Do you see do you see the address here? <laughs> so that was my fallback. I didn't have to do it. I probably I probably would have told you about it if I did it. I don't know. We'll never know, right? Different reasonable voting methods produce different outcomes. That by the way wasn't entirely rigged. It was the results of an actual set of votes. I didn't just make it up entirely, but Okay, anyway, let's talk about fairness now, right? Given that these different systems produce different outcomes and they all seem fairly reasonable, not all of them, but at least a lot of them seem pretty reasonable, which one should we use? How do we judge which are fair, right? That's what I want to talk about. Hopefully we can come with some basic principles for fairness and then choose a system which satisfies uh, all of our basic principles. So here's three basic categories. I actually made these categories up for the purposes of this talk. This is not uh, typically how, how these things are arranged, but I think it's convenient for our purposes. So. Preferences based. That is to say, the winner should be preferred over the losers. So I hope we can all agree that that should be part of what makes a fair system. Okay, based on decisions, if someone switches their vote, then the election outcome should change appropriately. I mean things like, if you decide at the last minute to vote for Obama instead of Romney, that decision should not cause Obama to lose, right? Because you decided to vote for Obama. The system should react like in an appropriate way to the way that people change their mind about things. I don't mean, you know, you change your mind after the fact. I just mean, if you decide to change your vote, then what you think should happen is what should actually happen, right? Uh, and then honesty-based. The voter should have no incentive to vote dishonestly in order to game the system, all right? You can imagine that might be a problem with some of these more complicated methods, say the board account. You might try to game the system by voting in a certain way to, to rig the scores in a certain way, all right? That's undesirable, all right? So let's talk about some specific ways to measure it. All of these things I've, uh, I've said have been a little bit vague. I want to talk a little more specifically. Okay, so for preferences-based fairness, we're going to talk about two specific criteria, all right? Um, remember, I'm trying to define specifically the idea that the winner should be preferred over the loser. So the first is called the majority criterion. It says if a majority of people rank candidate X first, then X should win the election. I hope you all agree that. A reasonably fair system should behave in this way. If a majority of people like some particular person, they should be the winner. All right? uh, this is satisfied by the, by the plurality system. In our system, if more than 50% of the people vote for a certain candidate, then they're going to be the winner automatically. It's not satisfied by the board account, actually. In this example, you can see a majority of people have ranked A in the first position. There are seven voters total here, and more than half of them voted for A in the first position. But because um, B is so high overall and A was buried by these other people, um, B's Borda score is actually higher than A. And so using the Borda count, B would be decided as the winner in this case. All right? I don't know if you say that's unfair, but it's uh, something a little weird about that, at least. All right? Uh, that's what I said. A is ranked first by the majority, but B wins in the Borda count. So we say the Borda count does not satisfy the majority criterion. That's the fancy language for that. Okay, here's another one. The Condorcet criterion. If some candidate wins in every pairwise comparison, then they should win the election. That was actually the case in our election. Um, Bosk won in every possible pairwise comparison. And so in a, it feels to me like that guy should be the winner. If, they're, if, they're, if everybody you know, ranks them as better than everybody else, a candidate like this would be preferred by a majority when compared individually to everybody else. And the Condorcet criterion says such a person should be the winner. Um, actually, that has a name. It's called the Condorcet winner. And this concept was due to Condorcet way back then. 
And this also, I hope you agree, is a reasonable criterion for fairness. Um, here's a little example. The uh, 2000 election between W and Al Gore. Um, the votes, I don't know if you uh, are aware of how close this election was. If you were um, aware of politics back then, you probably remember this. I'm still a little angry about it myself. Um, the votes were very close in Florida. The, it, it was more or less decided everywhere else, but um, the electoral votes were so close that the uh, results in Florida were going to be enough to swing the electoral college vote either way. Um, the votes were very close in Florida. Here's the final vote totals. This is absolutely absurd, all right? Bush got that number, and Al Gore got that number. Can you believe it? These are real people. So 500 people um, was the margin of victory that Bush had over Gore in Florida. And there was a third party candidate, Ralph Nader, and he got 97,000 votes, all right? Um, Actually, the, the, the name up here, Twiddle D and Twiddle Dum, that, that comes from, this is how uh, Ralph Nader referred to Bush and Gore. He, um, he you know, his whole deal was the, the Republicans and Democrats are all the same. Um, they're all corrupt and bad, so you should vote for me instead. And uh, enough people did to sort of screw up the outcome of the election, if you, if you want to look at it that way. If these Nader people had instead voted for one or the other of Bush and Gore, then it probably would have been a fairly... Um, a fairly wide margin of victory. Not, not really wide, but certainly wider than 500 votes. All right, and then there were other uh, third party candidates who got 40,000 votes. So those people could have had an, an impact also. Um, I, I'm not gonna talk about the other ones. Let's talk about Bush, Gore, and Nader. Nader is typically described as being far left on sort of a simplistic political spectrum. He was um, the candidate from the Green Party, which is sort of, um, in most respects, you would say they're like more liberal than the Democrats. All right. It's fair to say that most of his voters would have preferred Gore over Bush. All right. It's not very, um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to imagine that a person who voted for Nader would have actually liked Bush more than Gore. That's possible, but it's, it, that's a bit of a stretch if you, um, if you know about their political positions about things. Um, so if they had been actually recording their preferences rather than just saying who they wanted to be the winner, they might have said something like this. So let's imagine these were the Bush voters. And um, it's fair to assume that anyone who voted for Bush at the top of the ticket, if they were ranking in terms of preference, they would have said something like Bush, then Gore, then Nader. Because Nader was like this, you know, left-wing nut. And uh, Bush voters are not going to vote for Nader, all right? Let's also assume that the Gore people voted this way, Gore, then Bush, then Nader. This is actually being kind of generous to Bush because um, I'm sure a lot of the people who voted for Gore actually would have supported Nader over Bush. But let's just, you know, let's be generous to Bush and say that these people would have voted Bush, then Gore, then Nader. And now the Nader voters, I'm going to assume that they would have voted Nader, then Gore, then Bush, all right? Now this is, uh, some people uh, have, have argued about this over the years since then. Um, Ralph Nader actually has not really uh, ever denied the fact that um, his supporters probably would have voted for Gore instead of him. Um, he wrote a book called Crashing the Party about his, his uh, campaign for election and how it sort of ruined uh, Al Gore's chances of being elected. All right. Uh, okay, here's the tally. Here, Gore is a Condorcet winner. Remember, that means it's a person who would have won the election in, in, in any individual face-off. So if you only look between, say, Bush and Gore, uh, these people in the first column prefer Bush, but these people in the second two column prefer Gore. And if you add together these votes, they would have beat Bush, right? So the number of people who prefer Gore over Bush is more than the number of people who prefer Bush over Gore. And uh, Gore also beats Nader in uh, pairwise comparisons because, I mean, all, everyone in the first two columns prefers Gore over Nader. So Gore is a Condorcet winner. But Bush won the election because he was the um, winner under the plurality system, which is what we use. So what this means, the plurality system is not fair in that sense. It does not satisfy the Condorcet winner criterion. It is kind of ridiculous to think about the fact that most people who voted in Florida wanted Gore to beat Bush, but Gore did not beat Bush. That seems pretty strange. That's an that's a actual picture of Condorcet crying, because <laughs> this was, I did uh, manipulate that picture a little bit. Um, the plurality system does not satisfy the Condorcet uh, criterion. All right, so those were two um, criteria for fairness. Let's talk about based on decision making, all right? This was what I was saying about how you could change your mind, right? Um, 
One is called monotonicity. That means sort of the, generally things are moving in the same direction. If you're a math major, you've probably seen this word <laughs> being used uh, sometimes in calculus classes. The idea is if somebody changes their vote to boost X's ranking without changing the other rankings, that this should not hurt X. This is kind of what I was saying before. Um, if I decide to increase my vote for a certain candidate, that shouldn't make them lose the election. That would be an absurd outcome. All right. This is satisfied by the, by the plurality system and the board account. Um, so they're pretty fair in that respect. All right. Here's another one, the irrelevant alternatives criterion. If someone changes their vote without changing the winner's ranking with respect to anybody else, this should not affect the outcome of the election. This one's a little more confusing, but here's, here's an example. We had the election between Romney and Obama today, and there were some third parties. Let's say that I voted and I ranked them in this way, Obama, then Romney, then Johnson, and then Stein. Johnson is the libertarian candidate, and Stein is from the Green Party. I uh, realized this morning that Stein is not on the ballot in Connecticut. But uh, let's imagine that I, I voted for them with this ranking. And then let's say Romney wins, and I said, oh, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. I meant to say Obama, Romney, then Stein, then Johnson, right? Uh, you, the, your response should be, that doesn't matter because <laughs> Romney was the winner. And that thing that you changed your mind about had nothing to do with Romney, right? This is called an irrelevant alternative. That's what I was saying at the top there. Someone changes their vote without changing the winner's ranking with respect to anybody else, then that shouldn't affect the election. Right? This should not affect the election if, if you're fair in terms of irrelevant alternatives. Again, this sounds reasonable, but the plurality system actually does not satisfy this. You can see in the bush Nader election, Bush was the winner, all right? But after the fact, if all the Nader voters said, wait, 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 I changed my mind. I want to vote Gore, then Nader, then Bush. That is irrelevant in the sense that I just said, because they're not changing the ranking of the winner, all right? But um, that causes Gore to win the election if they, if they make that change, all right? So the plurality system does not respect the um, irrelevant alternatives criterion, all right? Okay, last thing, honesty-based fairness, fairness of the honesty type. A voter should not have any incentive to vote dishonesty, dishonestly, right? Um, a system like this in which uh, there's no point in voting dishonestly is called strategy-proof. And if your system is not strategy proof, then the voters, when they decide, uh, you know, who are you going to vote for, they don't just, they don't only think about who they like the best. They also think about how can I vote for the right person to work the system in a way which is beneficial for my candidate, all right? They have to think carefully about voting tactically rather than voting their true preferences. And the plurality system is absolutely terrible at this. You can see in the same example, these people over here, they really should not have voted for Nader. Even though Nader was their true uh, preference uh, as a candidate, they should have, in order to get a better outcome, they should have voted Gore on the top instead, right? Because then uh, Gore would have been elected rather than Bush, which in their opinion is the worst option, all right? Their honesty is what caused Bush to win, and, and he was their, their uh, last choice, all right? So in the plurality system, it is beneficial to vote tactically, all right? This actually, if you think about it, has deep consequences for our whole political structure. I think the strategy in the plurality system is funnily ba based on vote splitting, all right? This is the fact in our system. If you vote for anybody other than a winner, then your vote was irrelevant, all right? You have to vote for the winner if you want your vote to mean anything. It do if you didn't vote for the winner, nobody cares what you said, all right? This is why I think politicians always claim that they're winning. If you look at... Um, you know, if you ask Romney today, so Obama is up in the polls, and you ask Romney, hey, what do you think about Obama being up in the polls? He'll say, I don't believe that. I don't think he's up in the polls. I think I'm going to win. And the reason he says that is not because he's a statistician and he's analyzed the polls. It's because he knows that people will only vote for a candidate who they think is going to win. That's how our system works. All right? If you don't vote for the winner, your vote was, was useless. All right? This is why they claim that they're winning all the time. I remember last time when uh, Obama and McCain were running, like a, a couple days before the election, the polls were showing that Obama was, was quite um, favored above McCain. And I saw someone on the news, they asked, you know, how do, someone from McCain's campaign, how do you guys feel about the fact that Obama's leading you in the polls? And they said, no, 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 no. McCain is exactly where he wants to be right now. <laughs> really? Is that... <laughs> It doesn't make any sense. I mean, anyway. Uh, this also, this, this thing about vote splitting makes the two parties indestructible. It means that, really, those people who voted for Nader, they knew that their votes weren't going to count for anything, all right? It means that 
um, people have a very strong incentive against voting for a third party candidate, right? And that has a huge um, impact on the way that our politics works, right? People think that, oh, we have so many problems in America, but that's just because of the two party system, and there's nothing we can do about that. Well, actually, that's caused by our use of the plurality system in, in voting, to, to some extent. Uh, here's a basic principle in political science known as Duverger's law. Um, any political structure based on the plurality system will, after a certain amount of time, develop into a two-party system. And you can look at the history of democracies, and this more or less is the case. The plurality system, after long enough time, two parties will emerge, and they will become undefeatable because everyone is worried about vote splitting. This is true in our world with very few exceptions. Canada and the UK actually use plurality systems, but they have um, sort of vibrant uh, more than two parties uh, involved. Although the UK, is, uh, my understanding is it's only recently that third parties have been a major force in the UK, and so you could kind of believe that that's sort of a, a temporary fluctuation, and eventually two parties again will take over. Uh, here's a little summary of all the criteria and all the um, voting systems we've talked about. And it, this uh, sort of tells you, you can, all, you can work all of this out. People uh, have been studying this for, um, for a while. This is the majority criteria in the Condorcet, the monotonicity, independent alternatives, and uh, strategy proof. Uh, when you look at this, so the plurality system is up here. It is, uh, does satisfy the majority and the monotonicity, but not uh, these other ones. Um, by this table, uh, the Borda and the instant runoff look pretty bad because uh, they only satisfy one. Pairwise comparison, and actually the random dictator is not looking so bad at this point, because it satisfies three out of five of these. But this, this is not the um, definitive table here. There are lots of other ways of measuring um, fairness of voting systems. Um, but this is just to you know, give you an idea. All right. Um, and also, you can discuss the degree of failure. So um, the instant runoff system is the one of these which is used the most often in the real world. And it doesn't satisfy a lot of these properties, but actually, um, there are ways that you can measure sort of how often does the instant runoff system satisfy sort of elected Condorcet winner. It turns out, in practice, the instant runoff system is, is actually quite good at a lot of things. Even though it doesn't always choose the most fair winner, it does pretty well. Uh, here's some bad news, though. Uh, natural question, is there any voting system that satisfies all of these criteria? And the answer is no, there isn't. And I don't mean nobody has been able to figure one out yet. I mean, actually, there cannot be any... Um, system of election which will satisfy all of these criteria. There are two classic, um, they're called impossibility theorems that show, mathematically show that no possible system can actually satisfy all of these. Uh, the first one is called Arrow's theorem, and this is really like the first big theorem in the, math in the modern mathematical theory of voting from the 50s. The 50s. No voting system can satisfy the Condorcet criterion and the irrelevant alternatives criterion. This is actually a, a slightly weaker version of Arrow's theorem, but this is what I want to talk about. Bad news for voting in general. It means when you're deciding which method to use, you just have to decide ahead of time if you want your method to be fair in the sense of Condorcet or fair in the sense of the irrelevant alternatives. And you cannot have both, right? You can't have both. Plurality has neither, so you get it both. Um, uh, remember 30 minutes ago I said this? We want a voting system such that if the people actually have a uniform preference, this decision should reflect this. That's kind of like the Condorcet criterion. If everyone prefers one person over somebody else, they should win. And the decision should not depend on irrelevant details. And I said something like, our goal is to come up with a system which obeys these basic properties. Well, that, uh, that's impossible, right? The first one is basically the Condorcet winner criterion, and the second one is the irrelevant alternatives criterion, and they're inconsistent. You can't actually satisfy both of them. Uh, actually, it's not so hard to see why Arrow's theorem is true. Um, uh, I think I'm going to skip this because I'm running a little late here. Sorry, if you want the... Uh, it comes from imagining an election like this. And then if you're going to choose... Um, uh, if you want to choose the Condorcet winner and also respect irrelevant alternatives, you can show that... Let's imagine... I guess I'm doing it. Let's imagine that you chose A to be the winner to begin with. All right? If A is the winner... Okay. Now, let's imagine that A wins, but then the BCAs change to CBAs, all right? That's an irrelevant change with respect to the irrelevant alternatives because A was the winner and A is still being ranked last. So you change to this, right? That was an irrelevant change, so A should still be the winner if you satisfy the irrelevant alternatives. But after you make the change, C has become a Condorcet winner. You can check. In this case, C beats everybody on head-to-head matchups. 
And so uh, you can't choose the irrelevant alternatives candidate, which would be A, and also the Condorcet candidate, which would be C, right? It's not possible to satisfy both of those. Another bit of bad news, this, is, this has a much cooler name, the gibbard satterthwaite theorem. For any voting system, one of the following things must be true. First, the system is dictatorial, that is to say, it's, the outcome of the election is decided by a single voter, that's a, that's a bad thing in general. Second, the system is rigged against one of the candidates, that is, there's one, one candidate who cannot, win, cannot possibly win no matter how everybody votes, that's also bad. And the third, the system is not strategy proof, all right? So the first two are obviously bad for an election method. You don't want it to be dictatorial, and you also don't want it to be rigged against somebody. And so the summary is, since the first two are undesirable, but the theorem says that one of the following has to be true. So for any reasonable voting system, no reasonable voting system is strategy proof. Only one of them in our, um, in our table was strategy proof, and that was the random dictator method, which is dictatorial. Right? No reasonable voting system is strategy proof. So what I just said about, you know, the plurality system has this big problem with strategizing. Actually, that's true of any reasonable voting system, unless it's a dictatorship or unless it's rigged against one of the candidates. All right. So you can't really get away from that. Oh, summary of the bad news. No voting system can be fair with respect to the Congress Day winners while also disregarding irrelevant alternatives. That's Arrow's theorem. And voters under any reasonable voting system always have an incentive to try to game the system. That's the Gibbard and Satterthwaite theorems. These are bad news if you're trying to design a perfect voting system. And I'll just say again, it's not just we haven't figured out yet how to design a voting system that avoids these problems. These are actually mathematically unavoidable problems. Right? So a little conclusion here. What should we do in light of this? The concept of a fair voting is actually logically inconsistent. It's impossible to be fair in all these ways. So what should we do? I think there's no clear answers to that. Here's a quote that I hear a lot from Churchill. Democracy is the worst form of government except all those other forms that have been tried. Um, I don't think he was talking about voting paradoxes in this way because they, they weren't known at that time, but I think the, the quote is, a, is appropriate. It's kind of like, you know, you, you can admit that democracy is sort of logically flawed at, at a certain level, but it's still sort of the best thing going. I don't think we should abandon voting altogether. And no, I don't think that. Uh, you, you should think about, should we continue to use the plurality system, which doesn't fare very well when you, when you consider its uh, fairness versus the other systems. Some pros for the fair plurality system, it's simple to do. It's easier for the voters to understand, all right? I think everybody understands the correct strategy in the plurality system, which is don't ever vote for those guys. Only vote for the, the Democrat or the Republican. That's the strategy in the plurality system. And that's fairly easy for voters to understand. Um, it's also easy to compute the results. Uh, cons for the plurality system, it's not Condorcet fair and it's not fair with respect to a bunch of other things that we talked about. Uh, it also encourages people to only vote for the winner, which is a bad thing. It preserves the two-party system, which is bad in a lot of ways. I think lots of our political dysfunction can be blamed on the two parties. I said this before. Most people see this as unavoidable, but actually it's because we're using the plurality system. All right. Um, the the uh, sort of dominance of two parties doesn't completely go away under other systems, but it gets a lot better if you switch to uh, other things. For instance, Ralph Nader, I just heard him on the radio uh, two days ago, and he was saying, we need to use instant runoff voting in the United States because uh, I'm still angry that I lost that election. <laughs> he didn't say that, but uh, he, he's big on you know, third parties. If you want third parties to be real players, you can't use the plurality system. All right, so here's my question. To think about? Do you think the Democratic and Republican politicians will ever seriously consider dismantling the plur plurality system? This is the system which voters don't even think about, but the parties depend on for their survival. Think about that. Do you think these guys in power will ever actually decide, hey, why don't we, why don't we do things a different way, in a way which can uh, benefit everybody except us? <laughs> I have this little picture I thought, some pigs with wings on them. That, you know, think about that for a little while. <laughs> I actually thought long and hard about what, what picture to use. I, I felt that I needed a picture at the end to answer this question. Um, I'll show you my, my other, other things. Here's one of my kids with sort of a what you're talking about Willis kind of look. <laughs> and then uh, this is a monkey riding on a dog. I don't, it, it seems somehow appropriate. Um, if you think that they would ever decide to abandon the plurality system, which favors them, um, Maybe you should look at a picture of a monkey riding a dog. I don't know. I don't know. 
Anyway, that's it. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, you can. Um, Wikipedia has actually very good articles about this. Check out Voting System, and it has uh, it has like a huge table like the one that I had, but with lots more voting methods and lots more fairness criteria. Um, and if you if you want to uh, check out these slides later on, you can look at my website. That's all. Thanks.